It's Cinna Massacre's Monster Madness. Last sequel-a-thon, we talked about the Universal Frankenstein series. Now, it's Hammer Time! That's right, this week we'll be discussing the Hammer Frankenstein series. Curse of Frankenstein was released in 1957 and was Hammer's first color horror film. This is the movie that established Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee as the new horror stars for a new generation. It also put director Terence Fisher into the big leagues with all the masters like James Whale. Universal's Frankenstein was so famous, there was almost no point of remaking it. Whenever you mention Frankenstein, that's the version that comes to everyone's minds. So that's why you have to admire Hammer's effort, that they had the balls to remake it and to take it in their own direction. The opening prologue says, More than a hundred years ago, in a mountain village in Switzerland, lived a man whose strange experiments with the dead have since become legend. As if we didn't already know. All you need to say is Frankenstein. But I like it. It's taking a humble approach and allowing you to forget everything you know and start over again fresh and new. It starts out with Peter Cushing as Victor Frankenstein in a prison cell telling a story. We jump back to see him as a young pupil who looks nothing like Peter Cushing, learning about science under his mentor, a man named Paul. Hammer's favorite name. Afterwards, in the Dracula sequels, they name their heroes Paul three consecutive times. When Frankenstein grows up, he and Paul continue to work together on science experiments. Their greatest achievement is bringing a dead dog back to life. Frankenstein grows smarter and more ambitious, and eventually decides to bring life to an inanimate human being, which Paul thinks is going too far. I like the mentor-pupil thing. But we all know what's going to happen. We all know Frankenstein creates a monster, but Paul taught Frankenstein, so perhaps it's he who created the real monster. It brings to mind Obi-Wan training Anakin, only to lose him to the dark side. At first, Peter Cushing is not as compelling as Colin Clive from the Universal Frankenstein. He doesn't quite match his mad stare and doesn't deliver as much memorable dialogue. But give him time, and Cushing slowly manages to surpass Clive, especially over the course of six films. A character is defined by his actions, while Clive's Frankenstein steals body parts from graves and a brain from a laboratory. Cushing's Frankenstein is so obsessed with his work that he's willing to sacrifice human lives. He plans to use the brain of a genius and doesn't hesitate to kill him. What I don't understand he landed right on his head. Don't you think Frankenstein could have killed him in a way that wouldn't damage the brain? Anyway, you get the sense that Frankenstein believes that he has good intentions, that he's doing this all for advances in the field of science. So he's not doing it just to be evil, he's just really obsessed. What makes Peter Cushing a good actor is that he could play either a bad guy or a good guy. In the Dracula films, he plays the heroic vampire hunter Van Helsing. There's no major makeup change or anything. In both franchises, he looks almost the same. Whether he's opening a coffin to stake a vampire or to steal a corpse, he's the same guy. It's his performance that paints the picture of who his character is and his performance alone. Frankenstein and Paul get into an argument. Paul tries to take the brain away, and in the scuffle, the brain is damaged. Had Paul not interfered, the experiment might have been successful. I take Frankenstein's side on this. It was Paul's fault. I love the laboratory set. It's not as iconic as the Universal version, but the color photography gives it its own unique look. If this was a modern setting, it would look all white and bland and sterile, but instead, it's like one step above the room of a medieval alchemist. It looks primitive and crude, just as if Frankenstein really put it all together himself. The reveal of the monster's face is a real doozy. The monster's played by Christopher Lee, and from what I've heard, the first time Cushing met Lee, he was in the monster makeup ready to shoot. It wasn't the first time they were in the same movie, but it was the first time they shared the screen together. A match made in horror heaven. The monster looks very different from the Universal version, and that's because Hammer was afraid Universal would sue them. And it was probably for the best that they tried their own thing and didn't copy. That's what made it unique. Also, they refer to him as the creature, again trying to stay away from Universal's legacy. 
I like the look of the creature, but he doesn't have much interesting to do. The first thing he does after escaping is encounter a blind man. The monster doesn't speak, so the man feels threatened. He tries to defend himself, and then the monster kills him. It's as if they couldn't decide to make him confused and innocent, or a barbaric killer. It falls somewhere in between. The monster gets shot, and Frankenstein brings him back again. For some reason, now that the brain's been damaged even more, the monster's more obedient. There's a subplot that Frankenstein's been hooking up with his maid. She wants him to marry her, he laughs it off, and then she threatens to tell the authorities about his experiments. So, Frankenstein uses the monster's newfound obedience to kill her. Okay, he crossed the line. He's evil now. In the finale, the monster again goes out of control and attacks Frankenstein's bride, like in the novel. Frankenstein accidentally shoots the wife to death, but destroys the monster with the classic weapon of choice, fire. We end with Frankenstein being sentenced to death, but not before a visit from Paul, who does nothing to help. Paul's accompanied by the same girl who was Frankenstein's wife, suggesting that maybe the whole story was fabricated in Frankenstein's crazed mind. Curse of Frankenstein is an excellent retelling of a classic story. It may get a little hokey once the monster is loose, but everything leading up to the creation is stellar. It ushered in a new wave of color horror films. Christopher Lee became their new monster star, also playing Dracula and The Mummy, and he made a career out of two things, strangling Peter Cushing and getting set on fire. It's Cinna Massacre's Monster Madness. Unlike the Universal Frankenstein series, which followed the monster as the recurring character, the Hammer series focused on Frankenstein himself. It's an interesting concept to have a monster series without an identifiable monster, instead an anti-hero or human monster, if you will, and to cheat death, it's almost as if he is an immortal fiend. Revenge of Frankenstein picks up immediately where the last film left off, with Frankenstein being taken to the guillotine. The blade comes down and we cut to a bar where two drunks are contemplating trying to carry out some despicable deed. We're not given any details, so we're left in suspense trying to figure out what they're talking about. It's like eavesdropping on a real drunken conversation. Just look at these guys. What great characters. Turns out their plan is to rob a grave, and not just anyone's, it's Frankenstein's. But he's not there, and then Frankenstein appears and literally scares him to death. We can assume that Frankenstein set them up and took advantage of the robber's heart condition, and then snatches his corpse. I always had mixed feelings about this opening. I thought it was kind of frustrating that they don't explain outright how Frankenstein escaped the guillotine, and it was kind of cliche with them robbing the grave in the beginning. It's kind of like the beginning of Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, and uh, they did it again in Friday the 13th Part 6 with Jason. Um, but, you know, as time went on and I've, as I've rewatched this movie, I've come to appreciate the beginning for what it is. Uh, it's also important to note that this isn't a straight-up sequel, that there's a lot of continuity differences. In the last movie, only a few people knew of Frankenstein's experiments. But this time, the prologue says, the whole continent breathed a sigh of relief when he was sentenced to death. But this made the film more interesting, that now Frankenstein is so infamous that he has to hide his identity. He now poses as a medical doctor named Dr. Stein. Nobody's gonna figure that out! Well, it doesn't take too long. Pretty soon, he has to confess it to his new inquisitive assistant, Hans. Frankenstein has a lot of help this time. There's also an assistant named Carl, who is the one who somehow helped Frankenstein escape the guillotine, in return for Frankenstein to fix his hunched back. The plan is for Frankenstein to transplant Carl's brain into a perfect body, and this time, Frankenstein's gotten a lot better at stitching together dead limbs. His new creation barely has a scratch. Still, his methods are crude. He has eyeballs in a glass tank and an arm, which are cheesy as hell, but that brain, that's pretty gruesome for a movie made in 1958. There isn't much of a monster this time. When Carl's brain is switched into the new body, everything seems to be working fine. But there's a complication, well, more than one. 
First, as soon as Carl learns that he's going to be famous, he runs away because he doesn't want the attention. Next, he burns his hunchbacked body, but is caught by this real crazy janitor who thinks he's a burglar and takes the opportunity to beat him up for fun. Carl retaliates with the savageness of a wild beast. We can assume the beatings from the janitor cause brain damage on Carl, turning him into the monster. At least, that's what I get out of the scene. But if that's not enough, the same brain transplant experiment is done on a chimpanzee which causes the chimpanzee to develop a craving for raw meat. So Carl, too, develops this craving and goes on a flesh-eating rampage. Carl crashes a party, calling Frankenstein by name publicly, before dropping dead. Next, Frankenstein is sitting in a room full of people, fending off accusations that he's the infamous doctor they all think he is. Obviously, they're all right. But what I love about this scene is that Frankenstein puts up a compelling argument and makes them all sound foolish. It's one of those awesome Peter Cushing moments. Then we pile on another awesome and suspenseful scene where Frankenstein's patients all slowly revolt on him. It's a real nail biter. Finally, they unleash their fury. They beat Frankenstein to a bloody pulp. His assistant Hans, who had little purpose in the plot, now becomes necessary. He transplants Frankenstein's brain into a new creation, which Frankenstein already revealed prior to this as having his own likeness. So Hans puts Frankenstein's brain into the Frankenstein double. The authorities inspect the corpse and are certain that Frankenstein is finally dead. But he slipped away and cheated death once again. What a cunning bastard. The only thing that doesn't add up is if he could switch bodies, why would he put himself in the body that looks exactly the same? Wouldn't he want to look different so no one would ever know who he is? Oh, and guess what his new name is? Your next patient is waiting, Dr. Frank. Oh my god. Dr. Frank. <laughs> Dr. Frank. Oh, it never ends. Well, anyway, I love the ending. I love it so much that I'm able to forgive most of this movie's flaws. It's incredibly cheesy and it borrows a lot of plot elements from movies like House of Frankenstein with the doctor promising the hunchback a brain transplant. So there's nothing that original going on. But Peter Cushing just knocks it out of the park. All the supporting characters, no matter how minor, are all great. I like how it raises the stakes. Not only does Frankenstein have to deal with the dangers of his experiments, but also with the people who are trying to figure out his identity. It's a great, if not perfect, sequel, and it's just about as entertaining as the first one. It's Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. Revenge of Frankenstein left off with the doctor cleverly switching his brain into another body to escape the authorities. This opened up the door for all kinds of possibilities. What new tricks would the doctor pull off this time? There was a great foundation to build off of, but with evil of Frankenstein, they threw it all in the garbage can and needlessly rebooted the series. The only connection is that Frankenstein has an assistant also named Hans, which is really confusing. Nothing else ties in. It's obviously not the same character, so why couldn't they give him a different name? This was the first of the franchise to not be directed by Terence Fisher, but instead Freddie Francis, who also directed many other Hammer films. Now for an interesting turn of events. For this film, Hammer joined forces with Universal. That's right, a Hammer Universal co-production. This allowed them to make the monster look more like the Universal version that everybody recognizes. It's definitely no Jack Pierce job. This monster is a poor imitation. He's played by New Zealand wrestler Kiwi Kingston. Even Lon Chaney Jr. in Ghost of Frankenstein was better than this, and he did almost nothing. Now for something positive. The sets are magnificent. It seems the budget's gotten much bigger, and this might have the best looking laboratory sets of the whole series. While it's a visually spectacular entry in the series, I can't say so much about the plot. It begins with Frankenstein and Hans working on another experiment when a priest barges in to confront them. Because that's what priests do. Frankenstein and Hans have to leave now that they've been discovered, and they go to the town of Karlstad, where Frankenstein once worked. 
We're told in flashback the story of when Frankenstein first created a monster which went on a rampage and escaped, eventually disappearing into a crevice. Like I said, it doesn't follow the other films, so there's no good reason why this had to be a flashback at all. Also, it doesn't seem necessary why Frankenstein has to go to his old laboratory. He's not conducting his new experiments there. The reason he goes there is to sell off his old belongings so that he can fund his new experiments. But that whole part of the plot goes out the window because it turns out the lab's been ransacked. So instead, the attention turns to the monster, which they find covered in ice. Ice that looks like cellophane. They revive the monster, but the monster doesn't obey commands. So Frankenstein gets the help of a hypnotist, but the hypnotist has vengeance issues and uses the monster to kill his enemies. The plot seems to be a rehash of different elements from the Universal films, like in Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman, with the monster being discovered frozen in the ice cave, and Frankenstein's lab being abandoned. The evil hypnotist controlling the monster and commanding him to kill people is like Igor in Son of Frankenstein, and the whole climax with the exploding laboratory, just take your pick, it's like any of the Universal films. You can call it stale or pleasantly familiar. You can look at it as a best of Universal Frankenstein repackaging done in color. It's often considered to be the worst of the Hammer series. I don't think that's necessarily true. It depends what you're expecting from it. If you're expecting it to break new grounds and progress the series forward, you'll be disappointed. But if you're looking for all the classic cliches, then you'll enjoy it. The best way I can sum it up, if this makes any sense at all, it's the most Frankenstein of the series. It's Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. Frankenstein Created Woman has Terence Fisher back in the director's chair, so many would say this is a return to true form. The plot is a lot more original than Evil of Frankenstein, it's not at all predictable, but it may be a little bit too weird. Frankenstein's experiments have gotten so advanced now that he's moved past the point of transplanting brains. Now he's trying to transfer the soul. How does he do that? With a satellite dish. This takes it beyond the ordinary science fiction genre and into some kind of supernatural direction. It's nice they're doing something different for a change, but this is a little bit too bizarre. Take a guess what the assistant's name is. Hans. It's Hans. They named him Hans three times in a row. The Dracula series were all about Paul. This one's all about Hans. Anyway, Hans isn't just some side character. In fact, he's kind of like the main character in the movie. As a young boy, he witnessed his father being executed for crimes he committed. Seeing that as a kid would sure fuck anybody up in the head. But it's not that important to the plot anyway. Hans has a love interest with a girl named Christina who has a disfigured face. Her father wants Hans to stay away from her. Why he would not want anyone to show his disfigured daughter any affection, I have no idea. He's just some asshole who wants to keep her in the house. Speaking of assholes, three guys show up at the father's bar that he runs. This is one of the greatest scenes in the movie. At first they just seem like real snobby customers, but things escalate and they become real troublemakers. Get out of my sight! I don't know what these guys' problems are. They behave like children. First they're making fun of Christina and then they're drunkenly yelling at her window. Hans confronts them and ends up cutting one of their faces with a knife. That keeps them away momentarily, but later they break into the bar and they're caught by the barkeeper, so they beat him to death right in his own bar. What is the deal with these guys? They remind me of Alex and his droogs from A Clockwork Orange. Hans is blamed for the killing, and things turn into a courtroom drama. What does any of this have to do with Frankenstein? Nothing yet, but it's the most entertaining aspect of the film. I'm totally invested in wanting to see if he gets proven innocent or not. Well, things aren't looking good. The quarrels he's had with the barkeeper, the fact that he left a jacket at the bar, and the scar he put on the man's face all play against him. They also bring up the fact that his father was a criminal. As if crime is in your genes. Fucking idiots. Hans is executed, and Christina, just out of the blue, happens to be riding past the old guillotine when she sees her boyfriend's head being cut off. I guess history has a weird way of repeating itself. 
She commits suicide, so that's two dead bodies. And here's where Frankenstein comes in. He extracts the soul from Hans and puts it into Christina's body. So that's how Frankenstein gets the bodies. A much more elaborate backstory than just digging up some graves, wouldn't you say? And for good measure, he fixes up her face. I have the suspicion that the creation scene has been cut, because there exist a ton of publicity stills of the she-monster half-naked with Peter Cushing and a slab. It's all over the posters, on the home video covers, everywhere. I guess that's all it was, was one big publicity shoot. Well then, that's gotta be the most memorable scene from a horror film to never exist. Now she's out on the run on a revenge mission against all the bad guys. She seduces them one at a time and brings them into a room like they're about to have sex and then kills them. Now keep in mind, this is the soul of Hans in her body. It reminds me of when Bugs Bunny dresses up like a girl to attract Elmer Fudd. At least I thought Hans was inside the girl, but then he starts talking to her. Kill him. Kill him, Christina. So, is it like some kind of schizophrenic thing? Kind of like in Fry the 13th when Mrs. Voorhees thinks Jason's talking to her? Kill her, Mommy! But wait, that's not all. She has the head of Hans up on her dresser, which looks hilarious, by the way. It's a static image of a head being photographed against the same wallpaper. Today you can do a better job with Photoshop. But anyway, if Christina is talking to Hans, but Hans' soul is in Christina, then really it's Hans talking to his own lifeless head. It doesn't make any sense. There had to have been some kind of substance abuse involved when they came up with this shit. You know who loves this movie? Martin Scorsese. No kidding, Martin Scorsese once picked this as one of his favorite films. Well, it's anything but boring, and has some good things going for it. Even though the plot is completely ridiculous, there's something profound about the mistake Frankenstein made. He messed with the soul and body of two people who had emotional baggage. To Frankenstein, it didn't matter. Their emotions and how the experiment would affect them was no concern of his. All he wanted was to do it in the name of science, but he forgot about compassion. After Christina murders all the men and commits suicide for the second time, Frankenstein walks away, perhaps having learned a moral lesson. It's a convoluted, yet interesting addition to the series. It's Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. Frankenstein must be destroyed. How's that for a hokey title? Unlike Dracula, Frankenstein is a mortal man. He could be killed. Isn't the word destroyed a little extreme? The opening scene is just as hokey. Frankenstein is out decapitating somebody's head for his next experiment. Meanwhile, a robber sneaks into his lab. Frankenstein comes back wearing a scary mask, wrestles with the guy a bit, and he goes running off. This scene is good old campy B-movie fun. But why does Frankenstein have to wear a mask? I mean, come on. Just like in the beginning of Evil of Frankenstein, he leaves town because his secret lab has been discovered. He goes to stay at a boarding home under the name Dr. Fenner. Finally, it's not Dr. Frank or Dr. Stein. One of my favorite scenes is when he's sitting in a room with a bunch of strangers who are all scoffing at the idea of brain transplanting. Frankenstein turns around and puts them all in their place. The way he tells them off is perfect. It's another one of those amazing Peter Cushing moments. Frankenstein finds out the landlady's fiancé happens to be selling cocaine to make a living, so he blackmails him to help him with his experiments. Believe it or not, the unwilling assistant's name is not Hans. In fact, there's no character named Hans anywhere in the movie. Instead, his name's Carl. The same name as the hunchbacked assistant in Revenge of Frankenstein and one of the troublemakers in Frankenstein Created Woman. Yeah, Hammer had a Rolodex of three names for all their characters, Paul, Hans, and Carl. Anyway, Frankenstein's mission this time is to figure out how to freeze a brain. See, he already knows how to transplant a brain, but now he's trying to figure out how to keep the brain alive outside the body for a long period of time. His old colleague, Dr. Brandt, knows the solution, but for some reason his work drove him insane, and now he's in a mental asylum, unable to speak. Frankenstein wants to know his secret. 
So with the help of Carl, Frankenstein sneaks Dr. Brand out of the asylum to operate on his brain and cure him of his insanity. So Frankenstein knows how to operate on a brain to cure insanity, but he doesn't know how to keep a brain on ice? I'm not a scientist. I don't know what would be more difficult, but doesn't it seem like Frankenstein should be a genius? How would this Dr. Brandt guy know something he doesn't know? It undermines how clever of a character Frankenstein is supposed to be. Well, Dr. Brandt suffers a heart attack all of a sudden, which puts an unexpected time limit on Frankenstein's plans. If Brandt dies, his brain dies. So Frankenstein switches to plan B, transplant the brain into another body. He can cure insanity, but he can't cure a heart attack? I hate this part of the plot. It's too complicated and it's not interesting enough to even care about. We've seen Frankenstein transplant brains before. We've seen him transfer the soul. So this isn't very progressive as far as sequels are concerned. And where does the second body come from? Professor Richter. Basically some random guy we don't care about. What about the landlady, Anna, played by Hammer Babe, Veronica Carlson? What does Frankenstein need her for? I need her to make coffee. Oh, so she's the coffee girl, is that it? I'd like some coffee, Anna. Well, no, there's something else he uses her for, too. I don't even want to tell you what it is, but I guess there's no skipping around it. There's a scene where Frankenstein rapes her. It comes out of nowhere! I know Frankenstein's supposed to be without compassion, but this has nothing to do with his experiments. This makes him out to be too evil. It went way too far. Supposedly, both Cushing and Carlson, along with director Terence Fisher, all hated the scene. They didn't want to do it, and it wasn't even in the damn script. Supposedly, from what I was able to gather, it was executive producer James Carrera's idea to sex up the movie. Sex it up? With a rape scene? It's not sexy, it's disturbing! Especially coming from a scrawny, feeble-looking Peter Cushing. What was he thinking? What is Frankenstein's ultimate goal, anyway? If his experiments are successful, would he publicize them? All the bodies and brains he stole would be known. He would face murder charges and now add rape to the list. So, I don't know. Maybe he's just willing to serve life in prison in the name of science. With everything this movie has going against it, the last act makes up for it. Dr. Brandt's wife comes in, and Frankenstein tells her that her husband's been cured and is now sane. What he doesn't tell her is that it's not the same body. He's all wrapped up and can't speak yet, so he communicates through hand gestures. He answers some simple questions from her and confirms that it is indeed her husband. Then Frankenstein relocates again, but sloppily leaves behind the original body of Dr. Brandt. Mrs. Brandt happens to come across it and is horrified. This is genuinely heartbreaking because we, the audience, know that her husband is still alive in a different body, and we desperately want to see them reunited. Talk about lack of compassion. Frankenstein is a real asshole, and this makes for great entertainment above your average horror fair. Just like all of Frankenstein's creations, Bran escapes and goes to find his wife, but when he speaks to her, she doesn't believe it's him. Brandt, of course, isn't too happy that Frankenstein transplanted his brain without his permission, so he has reason to seek revenge. Also, Carl is out for him, too, because Frankenstein stabbed and killed Anna because she stabbed Brandt, a minor incident that wounded but didn't kill him. But before I get buried in all the details, let me wrap up this review and talk about the ending. Brandt sets a trap for Frankenstein, setting a house on fire. He insinuates that the secret to keeping brains in suspended animation is written down somewhere in the house, probably in his journal or something. I can only imagine what's written down in there. It probably just says, put it in a freezer. It's a cat and mouse game. Brandt is on a suicide mission, ready to lose all, just to take down Frankenstein. In one of the funniest moments, Frankenstein flees the house only to run into Carl. <laughs> Brandt wouldn't know who Carl is. He has no frame of reference. He's just some other guy who hates Frankenstein, too. But fuck him. This is his revenge. It ends with Brandt carrying Frankenstein into the burning building to die in the flames like all the classic Frankenstein movies do. In a nutshell, this is a great sequel. It's a little shaky at first, but the final act is excellent. For the fifth film in a franchise, it's not bad. 
It's Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. In 1970, Hammer rebooted both the Dracula series with Scars of Dracula and the Frankenstein series with Horror of Frankenstein. I don't really count Horror of Frankenstein as part of the series, not so much because it's a reboot. You could argue that all the Hammer Frankenstein movies are reboots because they all throw out continuity. The only thing that connects them all is Peter Cushing, and that's what Horror of Frankenstein is missing. This time, Frankenstein is played by Ralph Bates, one of the underrated actors in the Hammer films. He always gives an intense performance, like in Taste the Blood of Dracula as the guy who wants everybody to drink Dracula's blood. In Horror of Frankenstein, his best moment comes when his friend gives him the typical rant that his experiments are going too far and will come of no good. Instead of arguing, Frankenstein just says, Okay, fine. I'll stop right now. Well, I suggest we dismantle the apparatus. Nothing would give me greater pleasure. Then if you will start with the terminals, I'll begin over there. Yeah, yeah, go, go stand over there. Then he fries them. Veronica Carlson is in it from Frankenstein Must Be Destroyed, and Dave Prowse, who plays the monster, went on to play the monster in the following film as well. So even though Horror of Frankenstein isn't part of the Peter Cushing series, these recurring actors connect it all like dominoes. Dave Prowse is the same actor who played Darth Vader in the original Star Wars trilogy. The look of this monster is simple, just a muscular guy with stitches, but it works. It's monstrous enough without being silly. The downside is that he doesn't have much interesting to do. He just wanders around with that same blank expression. Seems like these Hammer films could never get a good enough monster. It's not a bad film by any means, but not a memorable one either. In 1973, Peter Cushing returned for one final entry in the series, Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell. You gotta love these cheesy titles. This was the last film for director Terence Fisher. It centers around a young medical student, Simon, who tries to follow in Frankenstein's footsteps. He's punished for body snatching and is sent to an asylum. At the asylum, he happens to meet Frankenstein. Cushing's age makes his face appear more feeble, which works to its sinister advantage. But that wig has got to go. Frankenstein is still conducting his experiments, posing as the asylum surgeon, under the name, ugh, Dr. Carl Victor. So, it's another Carl, and it's Frankenstein using his first name as his last name. Anyway, it's pretty coincidental that Simon just happens to meet his idol there. Impressed with his medical skills, Frankenstein takes him on as his assistant in creating a new monster. He gets all the body parts from his patients. And apparently from the fucking zoo! This is the monster? Why is he covered in hair? Oh, the monster from hell. <laughs> Looks like fucking hell. What was Frankenstein trying to do when he made this thing? It doesn't click with the serious tone of the rest of the film. It's almost as bad as the giant claw. The monster, like I mentioned, is again played by Dave Prowse. Funny to see him and Peter Cushing reunited in Star Wars. I love the grim tone of this movie. The Madhouse is a dismal, ugly, and claustrophobic setting. Instead of trying to be campy and fun like the other films, this one takes a bold, serious approach that is dark and depressing. I really want to like this movie for these reasons, but it just doesn't do anything for me. It does nothing new for the franchise, it's just Frankenstein creating another monster, almost deliberately this time. There's no interesting twists, nothing unexpected happens, and it moves at a very slow and uneventful pace. Frankenstein is introduced about 20 minutes in, the monster at 45 minutes. And following that, there's about a 15 minute duration of the monster being operated on, lingering on every gruesome detail. The ending is a complete farce, with the monster being shot in the balls and then ripped apart by all the inmates. It's an underwhelming closure to the series. Around this time, Hammer was winding down, just as they breathed new life into the horror genre in the late 50s, now, in the early 70s, a new breed of horror films were taking over. Think about it. This movie was released the same year as The Exorcist. The Frankenstein series may be dated now, but it's still one of the most interesting horror series to feature an anti-hero. 
any future Frankenstein remake should take a hint from the unique ideas explored in these movies. You could take the best elements of all these films and put it all together, just like the Mad Doctor himself. Like in the Dracula series, trying to track down all these movies on home video is a mess. Curse of Frankenstein is owned by Warner Brothers, Revenge of Frankenstein is owned by Columbia, Evil of Frankenstein is owned by Universal, Frankenstein Creed Woman is the only one that's still retained by Hammer, and was released on an out-of-print DVD by Anchor Bay. Frankenstein Must Be Destroyed is owned by Warner Brothers, and Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell is owned by Paramount. I don't know why so many other companies own the rights to Hammer films, but it would be nice if Hammer was able to release them all in one package. But then again, Hammer only releases everything in Region 2 because they don't want the rest of the world to be able to watch them. No. Region coding. Doesn't make any sense. Well, anyway, tune in tomorrow and we're going to look at another monster series. And this monster is in the big leagues. Music